Thank you. Uh, so I'm really glad since everything has been leading up to uh, this talk. So my goal is to just review um, those, uh, this general approach where uh, one attempts uh, to formulate, to reformulate quantum mechanics as classical mechanics in some topos. So this is roughly the, the slogan that quantum mechanics is pretty much classical uh, if you consider it in a suitable topos. And there are several approaches to that. I will mention the main names and one of the uh, names, namely that of Chris Isham, has, has been already mentioned today. I'll mostly focus on on a slightly newer approach, uh, which is due to Heunen, Landsman, Spitters, and, and others. Let me call it the Dutch approach. And maybe if time permits, I will just say a few words about a, a humble contribution uh, by Marek Kusch and myself, uh, just trying to apply these ideas to, to some other systems. So I hope this thing works. Uh, this uh, used to be my affiliation up till uh, September, but now I'm uh, in the real world, which makes me particularly glad to be here because I'm probably not going to have this opportunity very often now. All right. So I didn't prepare much, so uh, I, I hope I will uh, fit easily in the time frame. So the way we want to um, start is by looking at uh, the basic ingredients of a physical system in classical physics, the way we typically think of such a system. Uh, the ingredients we would consider would be the phase space, which is, the word space is important, it's probably something pretty geometric. Uh, in this sort of most classical approach, perhaps it should be a measurable space. So then the logic of the system would be uh, the algebra of uh, measurable subsets of X, let's say, or maybe some other Boolean algebra of, of subsets of X. And states would be probability measures on the phase space. And you've got those three items. Mm, they seem to be just as much as you need to talk about a system. You can make it somewhat more intuitionistic and uh, that will fit nicely with uh, what happens later, where you, you think of the phase space as of some topological space, not a measurable space, and uh, for your logic you take the topology, you take the Heidegg algebra of open subsets of X, so uh, you lose the law of excluded middle, you are now intuitionistic, and then states can be identified with probability valuations uh, on this lattice of open subsets, which is almost the same as probability measures. One thing missing from this picture is our observables, and I have omitted them uh, on purpose. So usually when you pass to quantum mechanics, what you start with are observables, uh, but somehow mm, we would really like to focus on things like the phase space and the logic, rather than um, some particular numbers that we would attach to a system. But anyway, in this, in this classical setting, uh, the observables would either be, in the first case, measurable functions on X, that give you some abelian von Neumann algebra, or continuous functions on X. In fact, this is a topological space, and then you get an abelian C star algebra. Okay. So, uh, one thing I wanted to say about this uh, intuitionistic description, which I like a lot, uh, there's a very convincing argument for that in, in a lovely book by Vickers, Topology via Logic, uh, where it is argued, well, I guess the argument is probably older than that, where it is argued that uh, if uh, you assume that you only want to build the logic of your system from propositions that, if they are true, then they can be proved in finite time, so by doing finitely many measurements, by increasing the uh, precision, so if you, if you make more and more precise measurements, then eventually you will be able to conclude that a true proposition is true, uh, then you actually have to uh, work with uh, an intuitionistic logic. So th this is very nicely uh, argued uh, by Vickers. So this is the mm, classical picture that uh, we want to 
start with. So now as you move to quantum mechanics, uh, there is this standard description uh, coming from von Neumann, and I will throw in uh, Gleason and assume that we are working on a separable Hilbert space of dimension uh, at least three, because then things are really nice. Uh, there is no phase space. This is a slight disappointment. Uh, there is a logic of sorts, uh, the, this uh, lattice of uh, orthogonal projections onto closed subspaces of H that we had just seen a moment ago. But this is a non-distributive lattice, although it is also complemented. And then states, uh, using Gleason's theorem, you can say that states are probability valuations uh, on this lattice if you interpret the, the term properly. So basically you want to, uh, whenever you have an orthogonal decomposition of your Hilbert space, uh, you want to assign probabilities to uh, each subspace in the decomposition so that they add up to one and the, 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 these assignments are compatible uh, in the obvious way. So if the dimension of H is at least three, then uh, these really do correspond to uh, states which otherwise uh, would be defined, uh, let's say, by density matrices. So yes, we end up with this uh, also complemented but non-distributive quantum logic. So this had already been argued, so uh, I don't really have to uh, give this example, but basically if you, if you imagine that what you are working with is the simplest quantum system imaginable, some uh, two-level system, let's say a particle of spin one half, then uh, uh, if you know that either the z-spin is up and the x-spin is up, or left maybe I should say, or the z-spin is up and the x-spin is right, then it's not the same as saying that simply z-spin is one. It was up. So that would be this von Neumann approach, and then uh, if you move to somewhat larger systems, like uh, in statistical physics or in quantum field theory, then uh, you, you, it, it is more natural mm, to describe the system using some C-star algebra now. So I don't know what the phase space is. In general, I don't know what the logic is, I guess at least. Uh, I wouldn't know what the logic would be for a general C-star algebra. And what you are left with are uh, states that are just normalized positive linear functionals on A. Continues. So the phase space is not present here. Uh, the logic is rather odd. And in particular, the, this logic definitely doesn't look like the logic you could associate with subsets of some space or subspaces of some space, uh, which is what uh, you would want to see. So you can remedy that, as it turns out. And uh, you can, first of all, uh, recover distributivity of the logic uh, well, the price you pay is that you lose all the complementation, so you have to live in the intuitionist setting, but we have already argued that this makes sense. So you can do it, and uh, then once uh, you have recovered a distributive lattice, um, if it has good properties, as we will mention in a moment, uh, you can recover the phase space from it, at least as a pointless space, and will be a locale. So uh, this is the um, outcome of uh, the Stoppos approaches to quantum mechanics. And the only complication is that all that is going to happen uh, in some topos rather than uh, simply in the topos of sets. OK. So the two main approaches to using topoi for quantum mechanics are first by Aisham, Daring, Butterfield, and others, and then a slightly later reworking of that idea by Heunen, Lanzmann, Spitters, and others. And this latter one is called Borification, and I'm mostly going to focus uh, on that one. So I'm going to talk about uh, Borification now. They differ substantially. Maybe I'll point out the differences at some point. But the uh, moral from 
um, from these approaches is that, as I wrote here, quantum systems can be assigned the features that we had seen in classical systems, namely a phase space and a distributive logic, such that this logic also gives rise to a good probability theory. So you can talk about uh, probabilistic states as some valuations on the logic. And also the logic really has something to do with that phase space if you work in a suitable topos. And uh, the idea at the very base of uh, these approaches is uh, what is known as Bohr's doctrine of uh, classical contexts, namely that any information that you can extract about the state of a quantum system is ultimately extracted by means of some uh, classical channel. So the only way you can uh, look at your quantum system is through something classical. You interact eventually with something classical and uh, that conveys some information about the quantum system. So this uh, leads to uh, this notion of classical contexts. So uh, we've already seen this uh, as uh, Boolean subalgebras um, of... Uh, the algebra of bounded operators in a Hilbert space in the previous talk. So here I call it the partially ordered set of orthogonal decompositions of our Hilbert space. Uh, if you use this C star algebras, then you are working with the partially ordered set of abelian subalgebras of, uh, of a C star algebra um, A. So in one case, uh, this set is ordered by refinement of orthogonal decompositions. In the other, it's ordered by inclusion um, of subalgebras. But the main point is that those are indeed partially ordered sets and that the ordering expresses refinement uh, of information available through such a uh, classical channel. So why a subalgebra? You might imagine that uh, you have your quantum system, you pair it with uh, some classical measurement device, I mean, quantum and classical, and uh, ultimately, what you observe is only the classical piece uh, that shows you a number. So what you are going to observe eventually uh, is some abelian subalgebra that would simply be, uh, let's say, the C star algebra of uh, bounded uh, continuous functions on, on the phase space of the classical piece of your system. So those are the classical contexts. So we have a partially ordered set of classical context, uh, contexts and at each context uh, you can extract some information from the quantum system. So when you put them together and uh, you try to do some mathematics at each context separately and then somehow require some uh, compatibility between them, you arrive at the uh, topos of functors from the partially ordered set of contexts, considered as a category, to uh, the category of sets. That's a Kripke topos. And this is going to be precisely the uh, topos in which uh, you can realize the quantum system as a classical system uh, internally. So if you look at it internally, it looks very classical. All right, so in order to get the uh, we have to go through uh, a few reformulations uh, to make our mm, description sufficiently intuitionistic. So, uh, if you read the papers, by, especially by the Dutch school, so the Borification School, then uh, what they use is uh, in, an interpretation of higher order logic in a topos. But I don't want to do that, I want to keep it somewhat more concrete. Uh, so that's how we are going to describe it. So uh, we started with a topological phase space, which we call X, and then we uh, looked at the lattice of open subsets, and that was our intuitionistic logic of this system. Uh, so we are going to reformulate it just a little bit uh, with the help of some notation. So bear with me for a moment. Uh, I need to introduce the following categories. Uh, partially ordered sets and distributive lattices. Then uh, monads already appeared, which makes me very happy since I don't need to introduce these. Uh, the ideal completion monad uh, on partially ordered sets, uh, which restricts uh, to the subcategory of distributive lattices. 
So uh, you can use this monad to uh, avoid uh, doing higher order logic. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a neat trick here. So then you can introduce the category of uh, DCPOs, or directed complete partial orders, as the category of algebras for the ideal completion monad uh, in the category of partially ordered sets. And you can introduce the category of frames as uh, algebras for this monad, but restricted to distributive lattices. And finally, you define the category of locales as the opposite to the category of frames. So this is the basic setup that you do when you uh, want to do uh, pointless topology, which we're going to uh, see in a moment. So one thing to say here is that although I'm defining those DCPOs as um, algebras for a monad, uh, this algebra structure, if it exists, it is unique, so uh, the forgetful functor that forgets the algebra structure is actually faithful. So you can just say that a particular uh, partially ordered set is a DCPO. So, I mean, of, of course, this is, this is a little bit silly, but the point is that in, on the next slide, we are going to do it in a topos, and th then it is not that silly. All right, mm, so what we did there, we uh, started with a topological phase space, and uh, we associated to it uh, the lattice of open subsets. So this lattice, in particular, is a frame, and you can recover the space from the frame uh, if the topology is sober. So if it's not terribly pathological, then, uh, then basically the frame is the same as the space. And this leads to this idea of pointless topology, uh, where uh, instead of thinking about topological spaces, you think about the corresponding frames. So since this uh, functor uh, that, I don't know if I, oh, I can, okay, I can do it. So this functor that uh, sends x to uh, the topology of x, this is contravariant, uh, so, if you want to think about frames as if they were, were spaces, so you should re then you should really take the opposite category, and you define this to be the category of locales. So these uh, these behave like spaces. So you replace topological spaces with locales, which are basically frames, only that you uh, look at the arrows in the opposite direction, and then you can say that the logic of the system and the phase space are the same thing which seems uh, nice. All right, and the last piece you need uh, is some probability theory. So uh, then you say that evaluation uh, on a frame mm, is a homomorphism from this frame uh, to this real interval. So both the frame and this real interval are in particular DCPOs, because they are both uh, algebras for the ideal completion monad. So you require this uh, map to be uh, a homomorphism of algebras, which basically means that it's continuous in a, in a suitable sense. And the really important part is the, the modular law, uh, which is exactly what you get for, uh, for probabilities. So this modular law expresses the compatibility of this, of this valuation with the lattice structure. All right, so this way, uh, we just took things that uh, we know, we just uh, formulated them in a very convenient way. Uh, the main change is that now uh, we stop thinking about uh, phase space as a, as a set of points, rather we think about it as, uh, as an incarnation of, of a frame, so of a certain uh, lattice, and uh, probabilistic states on our phase space are simply valuations, probability valuations mm, on this lattice. All right. So here I should say that P maps uh, the bottom to zero and the top to one. Okay, so this uh, can be now moved over to an arbitrary elementary topos. So the way I like to do it is uh, for these first order things, like uh, pose sets and uh, distributive lattices, uh, I'm just going to uh, define the, the categories of pose sets and distributive lattices inside E as categories of objects for which the, the home functor into X factors uh, through one of these categories that we have defined uh, on the previous slide. Okay? Well, it's like the approach through the representable functor. 
All right. And then uh, we can also construct an internal ideal completion monad. Well, you, it's not hard to figure out how to write it down. Uh, so it's a monad on the category of uh, partially ordered objects inside E. And from there, you just mimic what we did on the previous slide. So you define internal DCPOs, internal frames, internal locales, and so on and so on, which turned out to be exactly the same that you would get if you were to use this more uh, sophisticated approach through uh, the internal language uh, of the topos. All right. So then we come to the uh, subject of the real numbers. And uh, this is tricky. So uh, intuitionistically, there are different t kinds of real numbers. And in a topos such as the one we are going to uh, consider, mm, uh, depending on how we construct our real numbers, we end up with very different things. And indeed, uh, in this uh, work on uh, topoi for quantum mechanics, people use several different types of reals for different purposes. So for the purpose of probability, we are going to use the lower reals. So these are constructed as, uh, these would be constructed as uh, lower pieces of Dedekind cuts without the complement. So classically, you always have a complement. Intuitionistically, no. So, uh, so you only got one half of the, of the Dedekind cut. So uh, this is how you define the lower reals. And there's an, a sub-object that, that represents the lower reals between 0 and 1. So uh, we don't need to be that general. We can, for a moment, go back to our Kripke topos, so the one that ultimately is going to be associated with the quantum system. Uh, so that was the topos of functors, of presheaves on C. So then the value of this presheaf uh, at some context C, so at, at a particular element of this partially ordered set, curly C, is just going to be... Uh, uh, isotone uh, maps uh, from the subset of elements greater or equal than C to the usual reals. So really, it's a very, it's, it's a very simple thing. It's just a, if you if you imagine the uh, partially ordered set of contexts, then at each context you've got a real number, and if you move to a larger context, you get a perhaps larger number. That's how it works. Okay, and now. Uh, you can say what, a, what is evaluation on an internal frame now in our topos. So just as before, it's going to be a homomorphism of DCPOs, and it satisfies an internal version of that modular law, which is very easy to, to write down. So we basically re rewrote everything we had on the previous slide, now internally uh, in our topos. Okay, so now we can attempt verification. So it's a, it's a very quick account of verification now. Uh, in the original papers, you can see that actually there's a lot of details uh, that have to be checked. But in a nutshell, it's the following. So you start with a C star algebra. Mm, that would be the algebraic object describing your quantum system. From there, as we already said, we have this partially ordered set of contexts. So these are simply commutative C star subalgebras of A ordered by inclusion, and from there you pass to the, uh, I said pre-sheaf, which was of course wrong, I should have said co pre -sheaf. Uh you pass to the topos of functors from uh, the positive context to uh, sets. So in more down-to-earth terms, at each context you've got a set, if you want to describe an object, of you've got a set at each context, and uh, if you enlarge the context, you send the previous set to the one that corresponds to the larger context. So this is the main difference between the Dutch approach, so, so the borification approach, and this uh, uh, Isham approach. So in Isham's approach, uh, you get contravariant functors, so you get free sheaves. In the Dutch approach, you get covariant functors. And somehow, remarkably, uh, in the end, you are able to do pretty much the same, but in, in very different ways. So we, we stick to this one. All right, so uh, Heunen, Lanzmann, and Spitters, uh, they are going to construct an internal frame in this topos. So this internal frame is going to be uh, our phase space. 
really, if we think about it as a locale, such that, uh, well, at least if uh, the C-star algebra you consider is uh, the algebra of bounded operators on a Hilbert space, separable with dimension greater than two, uh, then those probability valuations on the internal frame are going to be in a natural one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with uh, states on the C-star algebra. So if you, if you read the paper, then uh, this can be made more general, but, but then, then you, you cannot state it in such a simple way. So that's why I restricted myself to, uh, to that basic von Neumann case. But you can make it uh, uh, more general indeed. Okay, so I shouldn't be showing that. So how are you going to associate a space to uh, ultimately to a C-star algebra. Well, in the classical case, you've got the Gelfand duality. So you get an equivalence of categories between commutative C-star algebras and compact Hausdorff spaces. Uh, don't worry about the compactness for a moment. We all know how this works. So several people worked really hard to uh, arrive at constructive Gelfand duality. So this is very subtle. This is, this is really subtle constructive analysis, but there is a constructive Gelfand duality which gives you an equivalence of categories between commutative C-star algebras and uh, compact, completely regular locales. Uh, so this is constructive, so once again, if you want to talk about C-star algebras, you have to make several things rather precise. For example, what are your complex numbers and so on and so on. So I'm not talking about, about that here in detail, but you can make it work in such a way that uh, it's going to work in any topos uh, with a natural number object. So I, I think the ultimate paper on that is by Kokand and uh, Volters? Uh, maybe I, I'm not sure. Yes, exactly. But I, as far as I, so Banaszewski was like in, in Grothendieck topoi only, I think, maybe. Uh, Right, yeah, so, but that was in a Grothendieck topos and then or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so it ah, so he, this, uh, I remember I was, I was trying to read up on the, on the sources and I think what I read was that the, 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 it was not exactly clear whether it was completely valid or, or not. I don't know, so I don't want to, I don't want to say. Uh, but they did uh, 15 years. Yeah, uh, so, the, so the history is uh, rather involved and uh, this is really uh, uh, a, a, a tremendous uh, achievement here. But once you have it, and, and uh, if you just accept it, then all right, that, then you just need, if you want to construct an uh, uh, internal locale, in other words, well, you want an internal frame or an internal locale, all that you need is an internal C-star algebra. Well, uh, it's pretty clear how to do it. There's a tautological one. Uh, namely, uh, so you're working in a functor topos. So what you do is, if you are given a context that is a commutative subalgebra of A, well, you just send it to itself as a C-star algebra. And then you can check that this indeed defines an internal C-star algebra uh, in the proper sense. So in the internal, if it really satisfies the, the properties that an internal C-star algebra should satisfy. So this topos carries an internal C-star algebra, and this is the one that uh, we are going to use. By the way, I didn't say, but uh, this internal C-star algebra is commutative. That's the entire point. So we started with a uh, non-commutative algebra A in general. Uh, we end up with, an, with a commutative internal C-star algebra, and then we can use uh, this constructive Gelfand duality to uh, produce an internal locale that's going to be the phase space and the corresponding frame that's going to be the logic. So this way, I mean, if, if you write it this way, it's, it seems really like almost a trivial thing, but uh, there is a lot of highly non-trivial uh, mathematics that, that, that goes into it. But in the end, you, you end up with, uh, uh, with a phase space. So let's say a few words about that phase space. Okay, so that's what I just said, right? The phase space uh, arises through the Gelfand duality, so as a spectrum of the tautological internal commutative C-star algebra. Uh, in general, it's pretty hard to describe, so uh, I think it took them two papers, the, the, the Dutch school, to, to give a, 
a, a full, very explicit description of, of this phase space. But if you're in a simple case, so if you are working with uh, just bounded operators on a, on a separable Hilbert space, uh, then it's pretty simple. Uh, so, so the first thing you construct is uh, basically what we've seen last time. So uh, you've got also a tautological internal distributive lattice that uh, to each context uh, it uh, assigns uh, the dis distributive lattice of orthogonal projections belonging to that context. So that's an internal distributive lattice, and then you uh, perform the ideal completion. So this is why I like this monad. So, so now you know that a frame is just an algebra for this monad, so you've got any distributive lattice, so we just consider the free uh, algebra for this monad, and you've got a frame, and that's the frame. So uh, at least on that level, it's, it's rather simple to describe, and then you could even try to uh, describe the phase space uh, in a more concrete way, but I don't have time to, to say this. I need to finish in a moment. Uh, just the last thing I wanted to say, uh, to give at least one application, because so far it seems like a, uh, like a fun thing perhaps, but maybe a little bit pointless, pun intended. Uh, so mm, that was, I think, the original motivation of, uh, of Aisham, by the way. Uh, so. Once you've got an internal locale, you can, it's a pointless space, but you can talk about the points. Uh, so a, a point mm, in, uh, in, in a locale, in an internal locale, is just a morphism of locales from uh, uh, the final locale. So that would be a locale associated with the subobject classifier. And then if you uh, decode our definitions, uh, in this case of bounded operators in a Hilbert space, uh, you would see that to give a point in the phase space that we have just described, uh, you would have to uh, prescribe for each classical context uh, an algebra homomorphism from that context to R, so that would mean to give a point in the spectrum for each classical context, and do it in a compatible way, so that it glues uh, to a single uh, linear map from the algebra A to the reals. And uh, well, it's a celebrated theorem of Cotton and Specker that this is impossible uh, as soon as the dimension of the uh, Hilbert space is greater than two. So you conclude then that uh, the phase space for uh, this uh, particular quantum system uh, has no points. So I think the, one of the motivations uh, for this program initially was to have a nice interpretation of the cotton specker theorem. So, well, at least it's a concise uh, formulation. It simply says that the uh, phase space of such a system has no points, so it really is pretty pointless. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much.